All right, so we looked at this, and then uh, this is uh, another uh, schematic of the uh, same global picture uh, we had seen, but now focused on uh, the Atlantic. Shows a little bit more details, and you can see the Benguela current here merging with the South Equatorial current, crossing the equator, uh, the Caribbean current, and Antilles current splitting around the Caribbean islands. Uh, looping around in the Gulf of Mexico and becoming the Florida current which then becomes the Gulf Stream and the North Atlantic Drift or the North Atlantic current uh, and then on into the Icelandic and Norwegian seas. You have the East Greenland current here, the Labrador current there, uh, the equatorial counter current. This little current sneaking into the Gulf of Guinea is the Guinea current uh, and then you have the southern ends with the subtropical front, uh, the Antarctic front, the Falklands current, uh, the Brazil current, and so on, right? Um, obviously, I don't expect that you will remember all the names of all the currents, but the physics of how these things come about, like the equatorial countercurrent, water being pushed, piled up on the west, flowing down the hill, uh, going into the wind is, is important. Um, the other thing to remember here is why is there a cross equatorial flow here? Remember that the uh, Atlantic Ocean is having the North Atlantic deep water formation in the uh, North Atlantic, Greenland, Iceland, Norwegian seas, and there is a mass transport and heat transport across the equator to feed the water that's sinking, again, mass balance, right? And hence, you require a cross-equatorial transport from the southern hemisphere into the northern hemisphere in the Atlantic Ocean because of this North Atlantic deep water formation. And again, the equatorial dynamic conditions and the changing Coriolis require that the currents and the mass cross at the western boundary where friction can generate vorticity to be able to cross the equator. Basically, you have one sign of vorticity to the south, another sign to the north, which means when you cross the equator, you have to somehow destroy and recreate vorticity, and this can be done by friction. So the crossing also happens in the western boundary current. So that's kind of a, need, a detail to remember. Uh, Gulf Stream is the best studied of all uh, ocean currents. Uh, it has lots of meanders and loops, and it merges with the, uh, uh, the uh, Sargasso Sea, as we saw. And there are lots of issues about how the southward transport of the deep uh, North Atlantic deep water happens. But this figure here is showing nicely a infrared image of uh, surface temperature. So surface temperature, which is emitting long wave radiation which is a balance to the incoming shortwave radiation that we talked about uh, when we did energy balance. You can clearly see the warm Gulf Stream that is uh, Florida current and the Gulf Stream hugging kind of the east uh, coast of the U.S., peeling off around Cape Hatteras at about 37 degrees north and meandering off into the North Atlantic as North Atlantic current. Because this is a nonlinear current, it begins to have meanders, okay? Also to do with the Gulf Stream, vorticity, and so on. If you move south, your vorticity uh, decreases and uh, you are pushed back north as a balance, and you might overshoot and then have to come back. So these kind of waves get generated. When that happens, some cold water from north of the Gulf Stream get can get trapped into a cold core eddy, that green blob you will see here, or when the warm water to the south gets trapped and gets carried to the north of the Gulf Stream, you can have warm core eddies. So you end up having these cold core and warm core eddies which can survive for months and months, and some fish can drift along, some biology happens with it, uh, and so on. So cold core rings, 
uh, obviously have cold water in the middle so they will be cyclonic and diverging and warm core rings have uh, anti-cyclonic circulation and converging water in them uh, and so on. So these rings play an important part and they have unique biological populations associated with them. Okay, so that's the uh, extension of the Gulf Stream. There's a very interesting Gulf Stream story associated with uh, Benjamin Franklin, who actually used to be the, uh, I think, assistant postmaster general or something in the 1700. And he realized that the postal ships, when they go from the US to Europe, would take almost two weeks shorter than when they returned and his cousin was a uh, ship captain and he asked the cousin what happened. He said all the whaling ships know that there is a strong current going from west to east so when you go east you can take this current and reach faster but if you come directly across then you will have to face this current and it will move really slow. So in fact the whalers were telling the ship captains of the postal services to go south and come back up and save a little time but the ship captains of the postal services thought these whalers were simpletons and didn't know any better so Benjamin Franklin actually collected this information and drew the first very nice map of the Gulf Stream okay he sketched the Gulf Stream very nicely and started using this information for uh, the uh, postal ships going back and forth. So you can Google and find this nice map of the coastal uh, of the Gulf Stream and the North Atlantic Current uh, drawn by Benjamin Franklin. He became one of the first oceanographers to identify a major, major current and actually sketch it uh, quite accurately. Pretty amazing, right? <laughs>